Section 2.6 is another excellent section in our pre-calculus book. It's covering rational functions and their corresponding graphs. So what we need to be able to do before we get out of this section is first of all, and we should already be able to do some of these, uh, is find the domains of rational functions. Use arrow notation. You'll see what that we mean when we get to those. Uh, identify vertical asymptotes. Identify horizontal asymptotes. Use transformations to graph rational functions. Graph rational functions. And then lastly, identify slant asymptotes. Uh, and then we usually try to work some uh, application problems, meaning some word problem applications to rational functions. Okay, first up, rational function. It's, it's any time you have a polynomial divided by another polynomial. So I say f of x is equal to p of x over q of x, where you know both p and q are polynomial functions. And of course, the denominator q of x cannot equal zero or else your fraction would not exist. So that means the domain of a rational function is the set of all real numbers except the x values that make the denominator zero. So the domain uh, is going to have a restriction of we know that that denominator cannot equal zero. Uh, the, the numerator plays no part in the domain whatsoever because remember p of x is a polynomial function. Polynomial functions exist everywhere. So I don't worry about the numerator when I worry about the domain. I just say the denominator cannot equal zero. Now, finding the domain of a rational function, and I've specifically given you one here that I would have a lot of my students, even really good students, they would incorrectly reduce this down. They'd say, ooh, that numerator factors to be x plus five, x minus five. The x minus fives cancel out, so can't I just call this f of x is equal to x plus five? The problem with that is you cannot cancel out a factor if the fraction couldn't exist in the first place. That's why I say here in the first step, the rational function contains div division. Because the division by zero is undefined, you must exclude any value from the domain of the function that causes the polynomial function in the denominator to be zero. Irrelevant whether that's going to algebraically solve eventually with the numerator or not. It can't cancel with the numerator if the fraction can't exist in the first place. So no matter what, you have to always say, well, I need to let that denominator, or I cannot let that denominator equal zero. So when we set the denominator equal to zero, it gives you the restricted value of x. So we know that x cannot equal five, that's our restricted value. And so we say the domain consists of all real numbers except five. Now you could put that in the set builder notation, x such that x does not equal five, or my preference, interval notation, the interval notation for the values of x that are okay in this problem is from negative infinity, up to five, union five to infinity. Now, what if we have another problem here where we're trying to find the domain of the rational function? So I would just say, well, every single solitary time, you're just going to say, set the denominator equal to zero, that's going to give you restricted values. If x squared minus 25 is zero, then x squared is equal to 25. Solve for x. Whenever you take the square root of both sides, the side not containing the variable you're solving for has to be the positive or negative square root. So we say, well, root of 25 is five, so x is gonna be plus or minus five. Now those are the values that x cannot equal, and this uh, polynomial in the denominator uh, would equal zero, causing the rational function to not exist. So we say the domain of the rational function g consists of all numbers except negative five and five. Now again, in the interval notation, what I would like to see there is from negative infinity to the lower restricted value, negative five, union from any value between the two restricted values, negative five to five, and then union from the larger restricted value on off to infinity, in this case, five to zero. Uh, you can also see the set builder notation. That's in inferior in my mind, uh, but that's pretty simplistic. You can just say it's x such that x does not equal negative 5 and that x does not equal 5. Now, 
One more example in which we're trying to find the domain of a rational function. Notice in this case, I'm giving you a rational function that has x squared plus 25 in the denominator. Automatically, you say, well, x squared plus 25, that's just a parabola shifted up 25 units. That's never going to have any x-intercepts. It's never going to equal zero. No, it wouldn't. You can show that to yourself down here by trying to set the denominator equal to zero, and you get that x squared is equal to negative 25. Now, when you try to solve out, you can say, well, that's going to be the positive negative square root of negative 25, which are plus or minus 5i. So the only values of x that would exclude the denominator or would cause the denominator to equal zero and cause an exclusion to the domain are imaginary numbers. So you say there are no real number restrictions. This number exists for all real numbers. Thus we have our domain from negative infinity to infinity. Now if we talk about a vertical asymptote, sometimes uh, when, when I discuss vertical asymptotes with students, I don't know what you mean. And this is also getting back to where I talked about the arrow notation in our uh, objectives for this section. So let me talk about vertical asymptotes and the arrow notation here together. Definition of a vertical asymptote, it says the line x equals a is a vertical asymptote of the graph of the function f if f of x increases without bound as x approaches a. Okay, please think about that. All that means is that as x is getting closer and closer to some x value of a, the y value is going to get larger and larger and larger without bound, meaning it goes to infinity in this case. Now, does it matter whether you approach a from the right or if you approach a from the left? No. In either scenario, the y values are going to increase without bound. Now, here's where that arrow notation comes in, and this is really a calculus limit notation, but we're going ahead and presenting it to you in pre-calculus. This statement on the bottom means as x approaches, the arrow literally means approaches, as x approaches a, and that little plus sign up in the exponent, it means from the right. So this says as x approaches a from the right, then f of x approaches infinity. Clearly, you can see that that's what this is happening. As x approaches a from the right, the y value is going to infinity. Okay, now over here, as x approaches a, the negative means from the left. So as x approaches a from the left, f of x approaches infinity. Yeah, as x approaches a from the left-hand side, the y value is going to infinity. Now, with that vertical asymptote, does the y value always go to infinity? Of course not. That's why I have to show this as well. So as x approaches a, you just, you just need to know that the y value is going to go off towards infinity or negative infinity. It's approaching some uh, uh, infinite value, whether positive or negative infinity. So you could also have a vertical asymptote in which as x is approaching a from the right, so as x is approaching a from the right-hand side, your y value goes towards negative infinity. That's what this statement, this statement right here is representing what this picture is showing us. As x approaches a from the right, f of x goes towards negative infinity. As x approaches a from the left, f of x goes to negative infinity. Yep, the function's going towards negative infinity, as the x values approach a on the left-hand side. In either scenario, those are examples of a vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptotes just need to be represented on the function with a vertical dashed line that's going to tell us that, yeah, the y values are going to go towards negative or positive infinity as x approaches that value. Now, vertical asymptotes are also going to be values that cannot exist on your original functions. You can never cross a vertical asymptote. It's going to be at those points where the polynomial, or sorry, where the rational function is undefined. It's where the denominator is zero. So that carries on to locating your vertical asymptotes. If f of x is equal to p of x over q of x is a rational function, which p of x and q of x 
have no common factors. So if you can't reduce any factors of Q of X with the numerator P of X, then you can say any zero of Q of X is going to be the location of a vertical asymptote of the graph of F. Case in point. Let's say I give you F of X is equal to X divided by X squared minus one. Okay. Well, clearly your denominator factors to be x minus 1 and x plus 1. Neither of those factors would cancel with anything in the numerator. So you can say, okay, then if x squared is equal to 1 or if it factors to be x plus 1 and x minus 1, the zeros are going to be at positive and negative 1. Either one of those values, if you tried to plug it in, are going to cause that denominator to be 0. So we call them zeros of the denominator. The values that are the zeros of the denominator are the locations of the vertical asymptote. So we can say x equals negative 1 and x equals 1 become the vertical asymptotes of this graph of f. Now, don't worry about where this graph comes just yet. That's not the point of it. But the point is to show you, okay, this function is going to have vertical asymptotes at negative 1 and 1. And as I approach any of those vertical asymptotes, the x value of that vertical asymptotes, as I approach from the left, it must go to positive or negative infinity. In this case, as you approach negative 1 from the left, the y values go towards negative infinity. As you approach negative 1 from the right, the y values approach positive infinity. As you approach positive 1 from the left, the y value goes, goes towards negative infinity. And finally, as you approach positive one from the right, the y values go towards positive infinity. Now we'll do all the other characteristics of that graph later on in this section in the homework. Uh, before I get to that, I wanna talk about all the basics of graphing rational functions. So we've talked about vertical asymptotes. The next thing up would be the horizontal asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes tell you as x is approaching some finite value, the y value is approaching an infinite value, either positive or negative infinity. Well, the horizontal asymptotes tell us the opposite. It's saying, well, okay, instead of x approaching some finite value, let's talk about what happens as x goes towards infinity or as x goes towards negative infinity. If as x goes towards infinity, you're approaching some finite value of y, then we're going to have a horizontal asymptote. Or as x approaches negative infinity and you approach some finite value of y, you'd have a horizontal asymptote. So please notice here I said the line y equals b is a horizontal asymptote of the graph of the function f. Uh, if the function approaches b as x increases or decreases without bound. So this first scenario, I'm saying, well, as x goes towards infinity, so if you move forever and ever and ever to the right, the y values are getting gradually closer to some uh, value of b. So if b is a value of 5, at this point it might be 4.5. At this point uh, it might be, ooh, come back arrow. <laughs> at this point it might be 4.5. At this point it might be 4.8. At this point, it might be 4.9. It's going to get closer and closer and closer to 5 if that uh, horizontal line there is y equals 5. It'll never hit 5, but it'll get very, very close. Similarly, uh, it doesn't have to necessarily be approaching the horizontal asymptote from below. It could be approaching it from above. So, and again, in this scenario, as x is approaching infinity, as x gets larger, the y value is going to get closer and closer and closer to b. Thus, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals b. Similarly, in this case, now over here, it didn't cross the horizontal asymptote. Can you cross a, sure you can. Uh, you cannot cross a vertical asymptote. It's an undefined part of your function. You can cross a horizontal asymptote, but still you just, you, you just have to say, the only thing that we know is that as x keeps on getting larger and larger and larger, the y value better get close to b. It doesn't say that it couldn't equal b at some point before that, but as x gets large, the y value better get close to b. So whether I'm talking about this one, this one, or this last one, I'm gonna have a horizontal asymptote at y equals b in each one of them. Now, 
um, talking about locating horizontal asymptotes, the process is pretty straightforward. What I need you to remember is that we're going to have a polynomial function in the numerator and a polynomial function in the denominator. If the degree of the polynomial in the numerator is less than the degree of the polynomial in the denominator, notice I say if n is less than m, think about that. If your polynomial in the numerator is lower degree than the polynomial in your denominator, as x goes towards infinity, that fraction's just gonna to go to zero because your denominator is going to be infinitely times larger than your numerator. So that's why I say if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, the x-axis or y equals zero forms your horizontal asymptote. Well, what if the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same? What if n is equal to m? Then you just take the fraction of your leading coefficients. You'll see I put y is equal to a sub n over b sub n is going to be your horizontal asymptote. And in the last scenario where you don't have a horizontal asymptote, what if the degree of the numerator exceeds that of the denominator? So if n is greater than m, you don't have a horizontal asymptote. You're not going to approach any one y value. It's going to keep on getting larger and larger and larger as x gets larger you might have what's called a slant asymptote, which we'll talk about later in the uh, uh, in this uh, notes. Uh, for a first example in finding horizontal a uh, of asymptotes of a, of a rational function, please notice the rational function I give you. It has a degree two in its numerator. It has a degree two in its denominator. So you don't even have to think about it. You say, okay, anytime the degree's the same, the horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals the fraction of the leading coefficients, 9 over 3. So the horizontal asymptote is 9 over 3, which obviously reduces down to a horizontal asymptote of y equals 3. Now I know what you're thinking. Is it really that easy? Yes, it really is. You just look at it and say if the degree of the numerator and denominator is the same, your horizontal asymptote is going to be at the fraction of the leading coefficients, 3 in this case. Now again, uh, we'll talk about where these graphs come from, but right now I'm just wanting you to see, and this function, if it has a horizontal asymptote of, of three, all that that's telling you is that as X gets uh, large, as it goes off towards infinity or goes off towards negative infinity, the Y value is going to approach three. That's the whole point of a horizontal asymptote. It's telling you what the function gets close to as X gets large or small towards negative infinity. Uh, what if I, I change up the function and I have my rational function instead of 9x squared, let's just say the numerator is 9x over 3x squared plus 1. Now this should be common sense. The horizontal asymptote is going to be 0. Why is it 0? Think about that. This is going to tell you what the y value becomes as x goes off towards infinity. Well think about if x goes off towards some large number like a billion, well, your numerator would be nine billion, eh, big number. But that big number pales in comparison to three billion billions. Your denominator is, has an x squared there, so it grows way faster than that numerator does. So you can say, okay, then that numerator divided by that much larger denominator as x gets large, the fraction's gonna go off towards zero. It does. That's why we have any time, every single solitary time, the degree of the denominator exceeds that of the numerator, your horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals zero. And I'm just showing you a graph of what this one looks like. Uh, notice as x gets large or as x goes off towards negative infinity, the y values are going to approach zero in either scenario. Uh, now, Let's talk about finding a horizontal asymptote of a rational function in which the numerator is greater than the denominator. It's kind of a badly titled page because there is no horizontal asymptote. Anytime the numerator is of greater degree than the denominator, you have no horizontal asymptote, period, end of story. Now, sometimes I might ask you to find the slant asymptote, and in which case, you would have to use long division to divide that denominator into the numerator. But if I just ask you about what the horizontal asymptote is, you'd say there isn't one. 
now this is a graph of that last one just showing you yeah, in this function, as x goes off towards infinity or as x goes off towards negative infinity, the y value is not going to approach any one number. It's going off towards infinity as x gets large. It's going off towards negative infinity as x gets small. Now, basic reciprocal functions. I need you to keep in mind the graphs of y equals x and the graph of y equals 1 over x squared because we're going to have homework problems in which we shift around these basic functions with horizontal and vertical transformations. So 1 over x, what are you supposed to remember? Well, you're supposed to remember that it has a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis because the degree of the denominator exceeds that of the numerator. It has a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. Why? Because you set the denominator equal to zero and you get x equals zero. x equals zero is the y-axis. So it has vertical asymptotes at x equals zero and y equals zero. And the way I remember it is I just say, well, okay, I could plot the point one, one. When x is one, clearly y is one. And then as x gets large, f of x is going to get small. As x gets small, f of x is going to get large. Same thing over here. If x is negative 1, 1 over negative 1, the y value is also negative 1. As x goes off towards negative infinity, that fraction 1 over x uh, gets closer and closer to 0, but it always stays negative. Uh, and then as x goes off towards 0, but stays negative, that y value is going to go off towards negative infinity. If you think about, well, what would be the y value at negative one-tenth? it'd be one divided by a negative one-tenth, which would be negative 10. So you'd have the ordered pair negative one-tenth, negative 10. That's going to approach negative infinity as x approaches zero on the left. Now, with the symmetry, it's going to be uh, symmetric about the origin. Over here, if you have one over x squared, uh, part of it looks very similar. Uh, the one over x and the one over x squared look similar for positive values of x. 1 over x squared approaches the x-axis and it approaches the y-axis a bit more quickly than this does, but it's still approximately the same shape for positive x values. Where it changes is this is an even function since x is now squared. So you can say, well, anytime x is squared and it's an even function, it's gonna be symmetric with respect to the y-axis, which means when you try to plug in a negative one for x, instead of getting a negative one for y, it's one over negative one squared, which is a positive one. And then you can say, okay, it's still gonna be approaching the x-axis from above, and it approaches the y-axis from the left. As, as x approaches zero from the left, the y value is going to go towards positive infinity. It cannot ever have any negative values for the y values because anytime you plug a negative in for x, that negative is being squared and made a positive. Now, let's do some horizontal and vertical shifts of these functions, namely the first one here. If I ask you to think of the graph of one over x and then tell me what the graph of g of x equals one over x plus two minus one looks like. So please remember back when we did our horizontal and vertical shifts. We said that any time whatever's happening to x happens to a number, it's a horizontal shift. You say, well, what's happening to x? Being divided. Well, that's the same thing as happening as what's happening to this plus two. So you say, ah, oh, then that's a horizontal shift. And you're supposed to remember with horizontal shifts, it's always the opposite of what the sign would imply. So this implies, okay, I'm gonna take the graph of f of x and shift it left two units. Now, after I shift it left two units, what also am I going to do? Well, this one, what's happening to x is not happening to it. So that's a vertical shift and that's just going to be down one. The sign is true uh, whenever you're thinking of vertical shifts. It's the opposite of what you would think with horizontal you keep it with the vertical. So I can say, well, this is just a graph of one over X shifted two to the left and one down. I tried to attack that in two parts. First of all, I said, I know the graph of one over X looks like this. It has my starting points 
one, one, and negative one, one. Well, what happens when I shift it two to the left? I'm gonna have the ordered pair negative one, one, and that should be a negative one, negative one there, that's mislabeled. And whenever I shift that two to the left, it's gonna be negative three, negative one, which please notice on the next page, that's what I have. So the first transformation, shifting it two units to the left, uh, we would say, well, that's just going to shift your y axis over, and now it's going to become the line x equals negative two. And we're going to go about that. We'll have the ordered pair negative one, one becomes the ordered pair, uh, sorry, the ordered pair one, one becomes the ordered pair negative one, one. And the old ordered pair of negative one, negative one becomes negative three, negative one. And then I could say, okay, once I go from there, I would then shift it down one unit. So you say, well, the original origin here was shifted two to the left and then down one. So the origin of this function, instead of being uh, uh, symmetric about the, the origin zero, zero, it's symmetric about uh, X equals negative two, Y equals negative one. That's your two asymptotes. And then you just draw in your functions. You say, well, uh, they're going to approach the horizontal asymptote y equals negative one as x goes towards negative infinity. They'll approach the vertical asymptote x equals negative two as x approaches negative two from the left. Same thing as x approaches negative two from the right, the y value is going to go towards infinity. And as x goes towards infinity, the y value comes back down and approaches that horizontal asymptote that's been shifted down one unit of y equals negative one. So as long as you understand and remember the rules of horizontal and vertical shifts, these problems should be very easy. Again, you also have to remember the base functions graph of y equals one over x and y equals one over x squared. Uh, now, what if our rational function is not simply just some horizontal or vertical shift of a one of our base rational functions of one over x or one over x squared. That's where the book brings in this strategy in solving out uh, rational functions. The first step, they want you to think about whether the function is going to be symmetric. Most of the times they're not, uh, but just like we saw the base graph one over x, it's symmetric with respect to the origin. The base graph one over x squared is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Typically, whenever we start doing other things, they're not gonna be symmetric about either. Uh, but we, you can at least look. Uh, step two, find the y-intercept. That's always a good point to know. And it's easy, you just plug in a zero for x, solve for y, you've got your y-intercept. Your x-intercepts, please remember, the x-intercepts are when the y values are zero. The only way that this function could ever equal zero is if the numerator equals zero. The denominator can never make it equal zero. So you can just say, well, I can ignore the denominator and just say, well, set the numerator equal to zero. That's going to be where my x-intercepts are because my function will equal zero at those points. Uh, for step four, we do set the denominator equal to zero, but why? You do that to find your vertical asymptotes. So your vertical asymptotes are going to occur where the denominator is equal to zero. Now, this is where the denominator and numerator have already been simplified out and canceled out any common terms. So if your reduced fraction uh, uh, has any terms in the denominator that can equal zero, then it's going to have vertical asymptotes at each of those zeros. Uh, the horizontal asymptotes, we looked at our three rules for that. If the rule of the numerator is greater than the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator and denominator are the same, then your horizontal asymptote is going to be y is equal to the fraction of the leading coefficients. And lastly, if the denominator's degree is greater than the numerator's degree, then your horizontal asymptote is just going to be y equals zero. Uh, step six, you can plot at least uh, one point beyond each x-intercept and vertical asymptote. Uh, usually, as, as, as long as you know what happens on the left and right of, the, of every vertical asymptote, it's gonna be a piece of cake to know what these functions look like. Uh, use the information obtained 
uh, previously to graph the functions between and beyond the vertical asymptotes. Remember, you can use the asymptotes to help guide your graph. As you approach any vertical asymptotes, the y values have to go to positive or negative infinity. As x approaches uh, infinity or negative infinity, the y values will approach any horizontal asymptotes. Let's take, for example, this one right here. If f of x is equal to three times uh, x minus three all over x minus two, First of all, uh, if I were just thinking about the symmetry, if I plug in a negative x here, you can say, well, if three times negative x minus three, that's giving me negative three x minus three over a negative x minus two, if you have to change the sign on that x as well. But if you look, that's not the negative of the original function. The negative of the original function would have to change the sign, not only on these terms, but also of these terms. So as is most of the case, this is not symmetric about the y-axis or the origin. So then I go into step two and I can say, well, probably more relevant to graphing it out are these next few steps. Finding the y-intercept, you just plug a zero in for x. And you can see when I did that in this problem, I got three over two. So now I actually have a point on the curve, zero and one and a half. The x-intercepts, you just set the numerator equal to zero. The numerator in this problem was 3x minus 3. 3x minus 3 equals zero gives me 3x is equal to 3. My x-intercept is at x equals 1. So I have the ordered pair 0, 3 over 2, and the ordered pair 1, 0. Find the vertical asymptotes. The vertical and horizontal asymptotes are by far the most important process here. Remember, we set the vertical asymptotes by setting the denominator equal to zero. So x minus two is equal to zero, gives us a vertical asymptote at the uh, line x equals two. And then the horizontal asymptote, again, you say, well, the degree of your numerator and denominator was the same, so you take the fraction of the leading coefficients. Horizontal asymptote here should be y equals three. That's where I got that from. You'll see I said y is equal to three over one which is just a three in this case. So if I plot those asymptotes, I'd plot the vertical asymptote at x equals uh, two. I'd also plot a horizontal asymptote at y equals three. So that's what I, I plotted the vertical asymptote, then plotted the horizontal asymptote. Now, I also went here and I, I plotted out some other points. Uh, you can do as many points as you need to make yourself comfortable with the graph. Now, on my math lab, they're probably going to have you uh, do a, probably about five points. That's usually overkill for what you need. Whenever I was thinking about the graph of this function, uh, as long as I knew the y-intercept was 0, 3 over 2, that's really the only point I needed there because then I knew, well, what happens as it moves to the left? By definition, it has to approach that horizontal asymptote. What happens as it moves to the right? It's gonna go down towards negative infinity as X approaches that vertical asymptote from the left. It's not suddenly just gonna miraculously cross your horizontal asymptote right here. So that helps guide the graph. Similarly, on the other side, uh, you could have plotted out a point over here, but even without plotting the point, as soon as I knew that this one was down, I knew that the denominator was an x to the first power. Anytime your denominator is odd power, like an x to the first, you're always going to have opposite behavior. If it's below the horizontal asymptote here, it's going to be above here, just like the graph of 1 over x. Unlike the graph of 1 over x squared, where you say, well, they're always on the same side if it's 1 over x squared. The degree of x in the denominator was to the first power, it's going to have opposite behavior. So if this side goes down as it approaches the asymptote, this side's going to go up as it approaches the vertical asymptote. And I would be able to graph that in. Now, if you wanna err on the side of caution and plot points out, you're welcome to do that. But as soon as I graphed this part out, I knew, I knew, and you should also know that this part looks like that. Use the asymptotes to help guide the graph. Now, 
Uh, one of the later topics in this section is slant asymptotes. Most rational functions are going to have vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymp asymptotes. Those are the ones that are easier to graph. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to graph when we have slant asymptotes. That's when instead of approaching a constant y value, Instead, it's approaching some diagonal line as x goes off towards infinity or negative infinity. Remember, slant asymptotes occur when the degree of the numerator, in this case, the degree of p of x, is going to exceed the degree of q of x. So if I ask you to find the slant asymptote of f of x is equal to 2x squared minus 5x plus 7 over x minus 2, and then automatically you can see, well, there is going to be a slant asymptote because the numerator is degree two, denominator is degree one. How do you find the slant asymptotes? You can either use long division, or in this case, since the denominator is a linear, you could easily use uh, synthetic division. Synth synthetic division is probably easier when it applies. So you'll see here, I use synthetic division. If x minus two is a, the factor in the denominator, you want to synthetically divide with x equals positive two. Remember, you'd find the zero there, x minus two equals zero, x equals two. So we synthetically divide with a two into the numerator of two, negative five, and seven. We bring the two down, two times two is four, negative five plus four is negative one, two times negative one is negative two. We sum the next column, seven plus negative two is five. Now please remember, that last term is the remainder. This is your constant and this is your term of x. So you can say, well, then that's telling me that that numerator divided by that denominator is equal to 2x minus one, and then it has a remainder of five, which means five is still being divided by x minus two. Now, the whole point of a slant asymptote is it's trying to tell you what the function is going to as x gets to a large value. Well, as x gets to a large value, this fraction here on the end cancels out. So please think about that. If I were to plug in x equals a billion, you'd have two times a billion minus one, okay, and then plus five divided by a billion minus two. Well, that last number would be so incredibly small, five over a billion, let's not even worry about it. And then we don't worry about it. The slant asymptote automatically is going to ignore any remainder part. So if I were to ask you what's the slant asymptote of this, and I wish I had circled it here, your slant asymptote is just 2x minus one, and you ignore the remainder. Now, looking at an application problem here, uh, and this is a pretty simplistic one, uh, but your uh, problems in the homework are as well. Uh, notice it says, a company is planning to manufacture wheelchairs that are light, fast, and beautiful. The fixed monthly cost will be $500,000. So before they can even start production, they're going to have a cost of a half a million dollars a month. Now, it's also going to cost them $400 to produce each uh, radically innovative chair. Okay, write the cost function C of producing X wheelchairs, and this is number of wheelchairs produced per month where the fixed costs are $500,000 per month. So you just say, well, the cost of X chairs is gonna be the startup, the fixed cost, $500,000, plus the cost per wheelchair, $400 per wheelchair. Okay, now, I wanna talk about the concept of an average cost function. So anytime I tell you to average something, like if I say we have five test grades, I want you to find the average. Well, you'd sum up your five grades and you'd divide by five. So what if I say I want you to find the average cost per wheelchair for production of two wheelchairs? You'd say, well, I'd find the cost of two wheelchairs and then I would divide by two to get the total production cost divided by the number produced to get the average cost per wheelchair. That's what this is doing. So it's saying the average cost function, it's nothing more than your cost function divided by X. So it's gonna be the cost of X wheelchairs and then divided by X to get the average cost per wheelchair. Gorgeous. So now 
if I say that average cost function, which is always just C of X divided by X, in this case, uh, 500,000 plus 400X over X, if I ask you to evaluate that at 1,000, well, notice I've done that here. You have your 500,000 plus 400 times 1,000, and then that's going to be your cost function. Then you're going to take that cost function and divide it by 1,000 wheelchairs. So my numerator is going to be 400,000 plus 500. That's 900,000 divided by 1,000 wheelchairs. Well, that's telling you that the average cost per wheelchair, it's costing you on average $900 per wheelchair to make them that month. So that's what this is. The average cost per wheelchair of producing 1,000 wheelchairs per month is $900. Okay. So what if you wanted to ramp up production ramp up production, wheelchair ramp, huh? that was funny, yeah, unintended. Uh, but what if you wanted to ramp up production in order to uh, create a lower average cost? That typically happens with businesses. They say, well, it's just not profitable for us to make a low number of chairs, so maybe if we produce a greater number, our cost per unit will be less. And in this case, it would be. So what if I say, let's go to 10,000 wheelchairs per month. Your cost function obviously is going to increase. You're gonna have your fixed cost of 500,000 plus 400 times 10,000. Uh, that's gonna be $4 million right there. $4 million for the cost of each wheelchair plus the original 500,000. That's gonna be $4.5 million. But now this time you're dividing it by 10,000 wheelchairs which takes that average cost down to $450. So that cut our average cost per wheelchair. So increasing the production from 1,000 wheelchairs to 10,000 wheelchairs cut our cost per wheelchair in half. So you can say, well, okay, I went from a cost of $900 per wheelchair to $450 per, per wheelchair. Now, assuming it's possible, what if you wanted to even lower that by trying to produce more and more and more wheelchairs per month? So assuming that that possibility does exist, let's say you wanted to find the average cost of production of 100,000 wheelchairs. So you'd have your $500,000 fixed cost plus 400 times 100,000, but now we're dividing that by 100,000 wheelchairs that would give us an average cost of only $405 per wheelchair produced that month, which really, really lowers our average cost function. Now, the point of this is, as X is getting larger and larger and larger and larger, what is the limiting value as to what the lowest cost those wheelchairs can cost? You can see, well, obviously, uh, if you produce uh, more and more and more wheelchairs, the cost is going to get lower and lower and lower towards 400. It's never going to hit 400 because you have this initial setup fee that can't be accounted for, but it's going to get closer and closer and closer to 400 because that's the horizontal asymptote. You can easily see that if you look at your function, you say, oh, the degree of the numerator is one, the degree of the denominator is one. The horizontal asymptote is going to be at the fraction of the leading coefficients which would just be 400 over one. That's what I'm asking on the next page. If I say find the horizontal asymptote for this average cost function, and you'd say, well, the horizontal asymptote is 400. And all that means is that the production cost per or average cost per wheelchair can never even hit 400. It can get gradually closer and closer and closer to 400 as you uh, increase more and more uh, wheelchairs per month, but it's never going to hit 400. It'll just approach it from above. Uh, so that's what this is saying. The cost per wheelchair approaches $400 as more wheelchairs are produced. But remembering, it'll always be slightly more than that. Okay, uh, I think you'll find your application problems in this section very similar to that one. Please make sure you do try the homework, and I think you'll have some fun with it. Uh, if you run into any trouble, check your work against the solutions I've done from the book. They should match the My Math Lab assignment pretty well. And as always, if you run into any trouble, let me know. I'll be glad to help.